close encounters of the third kind, the science fiction film we've all been waiting for, says Ray Bradbury, who wishes he had written it. In fact, he continues, we were waiting for it before we were born. The ghost in us, the secret stuff of genetics was waiting. The life force was waiting, waiting to be born, waiting to be called forth. Now, is this true? Is Close Encounters what we have been waiting for? Can the object of our lifelong search be discovered for a price at the local theater? It is written. This is George Vandeman. Today, It Is Written presents the truth about close encounters. It is said that a mysterious spell hung over the entire set where the film Close Encounters of the Third Kind was being made. And a series of bizarre and terrifying events didn't do anything to relieve that mounting sense of fear. For instance, a ghostly presence so terrorized director Steven Spielberg and two of his associates that they were forced to pack their bags and flee in sheer panic from a hotel where they were planning the film. And at least a dozen times, we're told, the set was lashed by storm so fierce that some of the cast and crew believed that there must be a mysterious force behind them. They were horrendous hurricane-type winds with lightning and driving rain that kept ripping apart a tent that they were using. One member of the cast remembers thinking, there are bigger forces here that are making us go the other way so that we can't shoot with the tent. Now we will have to shoot it their way. And when there wasn't a downpour, it was equally terrifying, for eerie cloud formations kept floating over the set, and these those formations precisely resembled the one used in the movie to hide a UFO. And when they came to the climactic scene, depicting the landing of a UFO, suddenly a real UFO that they hadn't counted on and knew nothing about, with blinking and glowing lights, soared over the very set where they were filming. An actress, Terry Garr, said, it was kind of hard not to think that there was something up there guiding the whole project. She said, I found myself saying, all right, all right, just don't hurt anybody and we'll play your game. And John Veach, vice president in charge of production at Columbia Pictures, says, the presence of God was very much in evidence. At times we felt as if something was guiding us along the way. Was it the presence of God, my friend? We shall see today. Early in production, there was some squabbling among the actors because they were allowed to see only their sections of the script. But soon cast and crew were united in a common fear and then in a common fascination. And we're told that the making of the picture became an incredible spiritual experience. A spiritual experience? A religious experience? Perhaps. But what kind of religion? Belief? But what kind of, of belief? Worship? Worship of whom? These are very important questions. You see, the United States has long been known as a nation, a Christian nation. And according to a recent Gallup poll, Americans are still big on beliefs. About 94% say they believe in God or in a universal spirit. About 69% say that they believe in a personal God and in life after death. And 56% say that their religious beliefs are very important to them. But if this is true, if this is true, then how is it that prominent religious leaders commonly complain that we're in a post-Christian era, that our society is becoming more secular with religion not very influential? How is it that a Methodist newspaper sees little to suggest that religious faith is more than a peripheral element in, in American life? And how is it that historian Arthur Schlesinger, Jr. asserts that 
for better or for worse, religious faith hardly seems a living option for us today. Strange contradictions, wouldn't you say? We're still unquestionably a nation of believers, but believers in what? You see, anything that a man takes up with may become his religion. He may believe in God in the traditional way, or he may believe in Eastern meditation, or in astrology, or in UFOs, or in pyramid power. It's still a belief. He may worship God, or worship money, or worship the devil, or worship himself. It's still worship. Now, ethics professor W. Waldo Beach of Duke University has described our American culture. People often talk these days about a decline of religion in American life, the loss of the faith of our fathers. I read this change not as a loss of religious faith, but a shift in the gods we worship. Most Americans are practicing polytheists, worshiping a pantheon of gods. Whatever be our official religion, our real religion is the worship of the secular deities of material happiness and science to give meaning to our days. Many people, you see, feel that traditional religion has failed them, and so they look for an alternate. They're faced with such a confusion of conflicting beliefs, 212 different denominations and isms, see, and speculations that they simply decide to make up their own. It appears to them that nobody knows what truth is anyway, and so when it comes to religion, so they might just as well design their own belief, have it the way they like it. Now, these people, when asked to designate their religion on some form they're filling out, they might write down Catholic or Protestant or Baptist or whatever. Whatever it may, that may see, I say, be the, the right thing to do. But their official religion will not or may not be their real religion. Their real religion may be completely invisible to the public. It's their private possession. Listen, my friend, here's what's happening. Americans today are fascinated to the point of belief by mysterious voices, by magic, by power to see the invisible, by pyramid power, by auras, by biorhythms, by monsters, by the Bermuda Triangle, by anything mysterious and unexplained. Now, some religious observers believe that this current interest in Eastern meditation, in speculation about Armageddon, and even in pyramid power is a good sign for renewed church growth. It's even reported by a popular evangelist that he was cheered. He was cheered by the fascination he sees all about him with UFO reports and offbeat beliefs because, now notice, more people seemed willing to accept supernatural explanations. And that brings me to the real heart of the matter. Is it really a good sign when people seem willing to accept supernatural explanations? Should we be cheered by the fact that people today are more willing to believe in the supernatural? I say, is it a good sign? Oh, listen, friend, it's a good sign only if everything supernatural is from God. But what if it isn't? What if it isn't? Can we safely lump together all of the supernatural and say it's from God? Can we put God and UFOs together in the same bunk over here and believe in both at once and the same time simply because they're both supernatural? Are the acts of UFOs and the revelations of spirit mediums and the strange tales told by people under hypnosis, are we to link all these with God simply because they're supernatural? Is the supernatural always from God? Hardly. We can't read the Bible very far without discovering that God has an enemy and that that enemy of God is also the enemy of man. That enemy, we call him Satan turns up in the third chapter of the book of Genesis. That's our first glimpse of him. And what is he doing? He's disguising himself as a snake, serpent, setting a trap for Eve by performing a supernatural trick. Serpents, you see, can't, can't talk. And when Eve heard and saw a serpent talking, she was taken in. Anything supernatural must be okay, she thought. And so, with her permission, she was deceived. She doubted and disobeyed God. And Adam, with his eyes wide open, realizing what had happened, 
joined in her disobedience. That's how our world was put on the skids. Now tell me, when Satan's first use of the supernatural was so successful, do you think for a moment he would abandon its use? Never, never. He hasn't changed his strategy a bit, except to intensify and multiply and diversify it until today. As we near the end of time, the proliferation of Satan's supernatural tricks, many of them undeniable miracles, is well nigh overwhelming. Oh, my friend, we don't need to be in the dark about Satan's use of the supernatural. We don't need to be unaware of what is going on, nor, nor will ignorance excuse us. For Jesus plainly warned us right over here in that first book of the New Testament, 24th chapter and the 24th, ver 24th verse. Listen. For there shall arise false Christ, and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, see? Insomuch that if it were possible, now watch, they should deceive the very elect. Did you get that? Great signs and wonders, then the Apostle Paul also said over here in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 14, 2 Corinthians 11, verse 14, he said, Satan, himself is transformed into an angel of light. And then the apostle John, in that last book of the Bible, he was the revelator. He gave the revelation of, Revela of the book of Revelation. He, here in the 16th chapter and the 14th verse, for they are the spirits of devils working miracles. Devil work, devils working tricks, simple little tricks, Devils working magic? Is that what it says? No, a thousand times no. Devils working miracles, undeniable miracles. In fact, in the 13th chapter of Revelation, we're told that an agent of Satan will even bring down fire from heaven. It says here in the 13th and 14th verses of the 13th chapter, it says, And he performed great and miraculous signs even causing fire to come down from heaven to earth in the full view of men. Because of the signs he was given power to do, he deceived the inhabitants of the earth. Now, does that mean that even if we see fire come down from heaven, it could still be a deception? Well, that's what it says, and that's exactly what it means. Well, you say, Pastor Vanderman, then what chance do we have? How can we escape deception if that's the way it is? Oh, friend, we won't escape deception by trusting our senses. We won't escape it by trusting our feelings. We won't escape it simply by blindly following the supernatural. Anything that is supernatural, you see, assuming that anything supernatural comes from God. And we won't escape deception by following the crowd. Our only safety is in this book, knowing this book. And even knowing it, knowing what it says is not enough. We must accept and believe what it says. Those who lose out in the final day will not lose out because of ignorance. Those who are the victims of Satan's almost overmastering deceptions in these last days will be men and women who have had contact with truth, who have known truth but have rejected it. Would you listen to some frightening words of the Apostle Paul? 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 9 to 12. 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 9 to 12. Here it is. The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with the work of Satan, displayed in all kinds of counterfeit miracles, signs, and wonders, and in every sort of evil that deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie and so that all will be condemned who have not believed the truth but have delighted in wickedness. Now, what does Satan use in his work of deception? How does he deceive men and women 
by counterfeit miracles and signs and wonders. He uses the supernatural. That's his favorite tool because it's his most effective tool. Now, why does God permit these people to be deceived? It says he sends them a powerful delusion. Now, he doesn't originate the delusion. You understand? He simply permits it. He didn't stop it. And why? Because these people have refused truth. They've rejected truth. They've made it clear that they prefer lies. They've made their choice. So God simply respects their choice. It's as simple as that. He lets them believe their lies and be lost. Do you see what a dangerous thing it is, what a fearful thing it is to refuse truth? It's not a light thing at all. Do you see what a fatal mistake it is to push, push truth aside and blindly follow the supernatural? Should we be cheered then by the current escalation in the belief in the supernatural? Or should we be scared to death, my friend? Should we be encouraged by the current fascination with UFOs? Should we reason that it's good, a good sign because at least people are coming to accept the supernatural? Listen, whatever UFOs are, or whatever they're not, or whether they're anything at all, the company they keep, or the followers they keep, ought to frighten us away. You see, the UFO cult is inseparably connected with spiritism and the occult, and that ought to be enough. And did you know this? Did you know that those who become involved with UFOs often develop symptoms identical to those of demon possession? Now, there isn't time to discuss UFOs in detail on our telecast today. But stay tuned to the close of the program. We have some vital information to share with you then. Well, how do you feel now about what happened on the set as Close Encounters of the Third Kind was being filmed? Supernatural? Yes, unquestionably. But was a divine presence guiding? Or did some other power, an alien power, a dangerous power, have a special interest in what was going on that day? Members of the cast and crew undoubtedly were deeply impressed. Some may be, have been converted, but converted to what? To God or to UFOs? To the Lord Jesus Christ or to the supernatural? Oh, won't you let me give you a word of friendly advice, my friend? If you're wise, you'll keep your distance from UFOs. You'll keep your distance from the film Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Oh, tell me. Have you ever wondered why it is that on this program we keep coming back to certain subjects again and again? Have you ever wondered why we keep talking about the supernatural and the hereafter? About the danger of being fatally deceived in these final days just ahead? I'll tell you why. Simply this. Satan is the great deceiver, and the scriptures reveal what he's been up to and what he has in mind for the future. And I think you ought to know the facts. It was back in the Garden of Eden that Satan, disguised as a serpent, and displaying his supernatural power, said to Eve, You will not surely die. That started the big lie rolling, and it has been snowballing until today almost everybody believes it. I say almost everybody believes that you don't really die when you die. And what is happening? Satan and his host of helpers, all fallen angels, you understand, are going around impersonating dead people, taking advantage of men and women when they're lonely and confused, grieving over the loss of a loved one. And I don't like to see people taken advantage of, and that's why I think you should know what is going on. And that's why we keep talking about the dangers of spiritism in all of its varieties. Satan's big lie, that you don't really die when you die, is the basis of spiritism. Spiritism will collapse overnight without a belief in communication with the dead, but it isn't going to collapse. No, not until the day that the Lord Jesus Christ appears in the skies to set everything straight. There was a day when spiritism involved little more than seances and Ouija boards 
wasn't too difficult to stay clear of it. Not so anymore. Today it's so diversified, so cleverly packaged, under so many unsuspected labels, that only the man or the woman who stays very close to the Word of God is safe from being taken in. It's going to get worse. Supernatural phenomena are going to become more and more convincing. Satan's deceptions are going to become more clever, more sophisticated, more subtle, until finally Satan will impersonate Christ himself, and almost the whole world will bow down. Am I being legalistic? Am I neglecting the old-fashioned gospel, talking about all these things? No, not at all. I just want to make sure that not one of you listening to my voice today will ever unwittingly bow down before a masquerading devil, thinking him to be the Lord Jesus Christ. And if that isn't gospel, my friend, I don't know what is. You see, more than a century ago, a little lady by the name of Ellen White, whose work bore every mark of inspiration, wrote these startling words about the spread of Spiritism. Let me read them to you. I saw the rapidity with which this delusion was spreading. A train of cars was shown me, going with great speed of lightning. The angel bade me look carefully. I fixed my eyes upon the train. It seemed that the whole world was on board. Then he showed me the conductor, a fair, stately person whom all the passengers looked up to and reverenced. I was perplexed and asked my attending angel who it was. He said, It is Satan. He is the conductor in the form of an angel of light. He has taken the whole world captive. Imagine. On another occasion, she wrote these words. Except those who are kept by the power of God through faith in his word, the whole world will be swept into the ranks of this delusion. My only comment is a question. Is it happening? Is the fulfillment of these words shaping up? I think you'll agree that it is. Oh, yes, friend, lying wonders will soon take the world captive, and only a few will escape. How will you meet the crisis? How will I meet it? You see, everybody loves magic, it seems. There's something in the heart of this restless generation that says to those who would win its attention, entertain us, amuse us, mystify us, startle us, stun us, dazzle our eyes, light up the sky at midnight, make bread of stones, boggle our minds, hypnotize us with decibels, Shatter our emotions, give us the spectacular, put us in a trance, work us up to a frenzy, and we'll follow you anywhere without asking why. That, I say, is the spirit of this generation, and never was a generation in greater peril. Never have men and women walked in paths so unsafe, so perilously near the, the end of the press, the edge of the precipice. We've come to the time when we shall have to decide whether our religion will be magical or moral, whether it will be a religion of emotion of response or of responsibility, whether we want our eyes dazzled or our feet kept from slipping. That's the difference. We shall have to decide whether we prefer the supernatural performance of the showman or the quiet miracle of a new heart. We shall have to choose between Jesus the Superstar and Jesus the Crucified, the one, of course, only a superficial, sentimental, non-existent fiction, and the other an eternal reality, a living Savior. When we come to the final crisis hour, the hour in which our eternal destiny is decided, the hour from which there is no turning back, in that irreversible hour, what will we do? Will we trust our senses or the Word of God? Will we trust our feelings or hold fast to a thus saith the Lord? Will we blindly follow the spectacular into the, the center of deception? 
never to escape her, will we listen for the still small voice that says, this is the way, walk you in it and safely follow it home. That's the decision that we'll have to make sooner or later. We might just as well make it now, and I invite you to do so as we pray. Our Heavenly Father, on the Savior's side we take our stand. We can do no other. The only safe and dependable foundation is the one provided in Jesus Christ. We place our feet on that solid rock just now without delay. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. Thank God for truth that not only settles confusion, Lord, but truth that saves. In Jesus' saving name we ask it. Amen. I'm Lonnie Melashenko. Pastor Vandeman has been talking about some very vital things this half hour, and you're sure to have questions, maybe some confusion. That's why we're offering you today as our gift Pastor Vandeman's very important book, The Impersonation Game. The truth is that unless you want to be the victim of a worldwide hoax, you desperately need the information in this book. We'll tell you in a moment how to ask for your copy. The Impersonation Game. A massive deception is sweeping the world, and you need to know what is going on. You need to know who the impersonators are and what they are up to. Not to recognize their propaganda could easily be fatal. Don't let anything stand in the way of asking for this book and reading it. Ask for it by name, The Impersonation Game. And now here is the information you need. You may request Pastor Vandeman's free offer by writing directly to It Is Written, Box O, Thousand Oaks, California, 91360. The offer is sent by mail, free and postpaid. Could there be an easier address to remember? Just, it is written, box O, that's simply box zero, Thousand Oaks, California, 91360. Please be sure to ask for the offer by name. It takes only a few moments to write, but it could mean a lifetime of satisfaction. While you're writing down the address, let me remind you to invite a friend to watch It Is Written with you next week on this station. The address again is It Is Written, box O, Thousand Oaks, California, 91360. Please mention the offer by name and write, It is written, Box O, Thousand Oaks, California, 91360. Now the time has come all too quickly to say goodbye, everyone. But remember, it is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. <laughs>